A reading from today comes from Luke's Gospel. It's found in chapter 15, verses 11 to 32, and you can find it in your purple Bibles in the seats in front of you on page 1049. It's Luke chapter 15, verses 11 to 32. Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. And not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. And after he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country, who sent him to his field to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. And when he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have food to spare? And here I am, starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. And meanwhile, the older son was in the field. And when he came near to the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me. And everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad. Because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray together. Father, as we come to this uh, oh-so-familiar story... We pray that we may see ourselves in the characters in the parable. But chiefly, Lord, we pray that we may see the Father and see you in the Father. Help us to catch a new vision of your love. How deep, how personal it is. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, There's a slide going up on the screen in a minute. It's a Rembrandt uh, sketch of the climax, as he saw it, of the prodigal son's story. When it goes up, just put your hand up, and I know that it's there. Thank you very much. Good. Uh, Sometimes Rembrandt's sketches are better than his paintings in the sense that you can see more of what's going on. I'm just going to leave it there, and I won't say any more about it, but it'll be there as a constant reminder of uh, one of the climaxes of the story. Parables work best when we allow ourselves to get inside the characters in the story. So I begin by saying, what do you think the younger brother would say if we asked him, why did you want the father to divvy up the estate and give you your percentage? How would he respond to a question like that? It's a reasonable question. And I wonder if he might say something like this. Well, first, 
basically the money's mine. It's all coming to me in a bit. I mean, he's in his 80s. He's going to kick it fairly soon. I might as well have it now. The money's mine. Second thing you might say is, actually, this is the way to independence and freedom. At last, I can be my own master, able to make my own decisions, shape my lifestyle according to what I want to be and what I want to do. And to do that, I've got to put some distance between my father and myself. While I stay in the farm, everything I see reminds me of my father's regime. And I need a different view. I don't want to be rude, but basically I need to be somewhere where I'm out of earshot of my father. And maybe the third thing he would say is, and I need to turn the estate into cash. Because this is going to be a new beginning and a new project for me. I can't do anything with fields. If I'm in a far country, I need the money. Now, once I have the cash, I have a hotline to power, choice, status. That's the kind of thing you might have said if we'd said, why did you ask your father to give you the estate before his death? Now, we from outside can see that there's another side to these demands. We can understand them, but something's going to be lost. For a start, it means the death of conversation between the father and the son. That's an end to that. But that's a part of real freedom. But it's a a loss because it involves turning your back on the way the father has done things and turning your back on his values and on his morals. There will be new friends and new activities and new ways of living. But there is something much more serious there, something that's desperate when it gets lost. And that would be that this is the most unbelievable insult he could have come up with against his father. The father will get his share, the son will get his share of the farm when the father dies. But to ask for that in advance is to make a terrible attack, an insult on the father. Because what he's actually saying is, I would quite like my father dead now, please. Uh, There's a scholar called Kenneth Bailey who has spent much of his ministry in the Middle East and in the Far East, and he did something quite interesting. He said, over the last 15 years, I have uh, asked people from all works of life, from Morocco to India, from Turkey to the Sudan, and I've asked them the same question, and I've had the same conversation with them all for 15 years. And the question is, Has anyone ever made such a request as this younger brother, younger son, in your village? And he said, time and again and again and again and again, didn't matter where I was in the east, I got the answer, never. So then he follows it up. Could anyone make such a request in your village? And gets the answer, impossible. So then he asks, if anyone in your village did make such a request, what would happen? And he said, again and again and again, I get the answer. His father would beat him, of course. And then Bailey says, why? And the answer would be, well, the request means he wants his father to die. And so the father in the story is left bereft, insulted, rejected, abused, deeply shamed in the eyes of the village. And if you presented that to the boy and said, this is the negative side of all the things that you said when when we asked you why you wanted the money, this is the negative side, then I guess the boy would say something, well, you can't make an omelette without breaking eggs, can you? 
Now, I don't know about you, but I expect you may well be feeling shocked and disapproving. But the parable asks us if there is something of the younger son in us. Because this is Jesus' way of painting a picture of what it is to be human. This is a picture from Jesus of humankind's condition. And the essence of sin is not murder. That is a sin. The essence of sin is not sexual violence, though that is a sin. The essence of sin is not the abuse of the weak and vulnerable or all the other things that make it to the Sunday newspaper. The essence of sin, the heart of sin, according to the way Jesus paints the picture, is rejecting the goodness of God, our Creator and our Father. It's arrogantly taking his gifts and treating them as if they were our property. It's using his gifts entirely for one's own self-centered project. It's getting away from God as far as you can. It's playing God in a world which you can treat as your private playground. That's the heart of sin. And all the other things that make it to the paper and the television just flow from that. Is this a story about someone else? Yeah. Well, of course it is, because it's everybody's story. Is it a story about you and me? Yes. Because we also know what it is to go our own way and find ourselves in a far country. As we know, the story does not end there. And there comes a day when all the money runs out, when the famine has taken away anything that he can eat in the way of food, and there's no talk of independence because a foreign master now rules the younger boy, the young boy's life. He is a, is a Jewish boy, as Jesus tells the story. He is a Jewish boy, seriously contemplating, eating the scraps that are thrown to the pigs. Everybody would have shuddered when they heard that bit of the story. But the Bible says that's where all human beings are. That's what sin is. The rich and the poor, the intelligent and the ignorant, the ruler and the slave, the comfortable and the oppressed, the celebrity and the non-entity, the respectable and the infamous, everyone, Jesus is saying, has the prodigal son's story as their own. So the first question I want to ask, as the parable asks it of me and of you, is what's the parable saying to us then? I'll pick out one thing, I think, just one thing. It's a reminder that Christians are not good people. Christians are people who admit that they were once far off and in a strange country. And by God's grace, they came to their senses and turned for home. How did the news get out there that Christians are good people? How did it get into the world that Christians think they're good people? This parable tells us, for me, the most important thing in the bit about the, pr the prodigal son is that Christians are not good people. We are people who grabbed what was not ours and went off and spent it. We're just people who in some way, when we're in the pits, turn for home. We're sinners saved by grace. So we don't say, and if you ask people, this is what people think we say, we don't say, do your very best and God will love you for it. How did that idea get out there? We don't say that. That's not good news. That's really bad news. What we say is when we were at our most desperate, God, who loves us, received us back into his home. And therefore, we don't ever dare congratulate ourselves. 
And therefore, we have no reason to look down on anybody else because we and they are in the same pigsty. Now, if only that message could get out, it would help. Because somehow the message has got around that Christians think that they're ready for the next stained glass window, really. When these break, get a picture of us up there. You, me, okay, you. No, not even you. Unless it shows us in the pigsty and God saying, come on, come home. So that's the first thing I want to pick out of this very familiar story. But a certain man had two sons. That's how the parable begins. It's a pity our Bible says the story of the prodigal son, because it isn't. It's the story of the prodigal son and the elder brother. And Jesus said a certain man had two sons. And he lost both of them. Someone has written, the problem with this parable is, can you stop being the prodigal son without becoming the elder brother? And it's a good story, a good question to ask. The elder brother never left home. He stayed in the farm close to the father. But in his heart, he was a hundred miles away from the father. The way he saw things, I spent my life in this farm being a slave to that old man. He sees himself not as a son, but as a slave. He complains he's never had a goat, not even a small goat, to make merry with my friends. And he greets the return of his brother with anger and a refusal to stand alongside his father and welcome his brother back. In fact, if you notice, he throws in a bit of slander for good measure. Says to the father, your son, not my brother, your son has spent his money, your money, on prostitutes. Well, actually, it doesn't say anything about that in the story. It may be the product of a jealous imagination. This boy is a long way from the father. A hundred miles away from the father's heart. His body has been at home all this time but his heart has been somewhere else. So ask the same question that we ask of all parables. Do you see the elder brother in yourself? It's a jolly uncomfortable question, isn't it? Often the mark of a person's spiritual barometer, his spiritual temperature, is how involved they are in church activity. But this parable reminds us that church activity can actually be a cover-up for having lost all contact with the Father. Church attendance, saying all the right things, giving a decent amount in the collection, singing the hymns loudly, that could mean a lot. But it might mean nothing. To the onlooker, you see, the, the elder brother was the model son but his faithful service actually concealed a harsh and bitter spirit. He refused to stand at his father's side. He refused to hold out his hands to his brother, refused to welcome him back into the family. If you'd asked him, he would probably have said, I, look, I, can't, I couldn't care less whether my brother comes home or not. In fact, having him back is a bit of a pain. Some writers have said, a real brother would have left the farm and gone into the far country and looked for his brother and brought him home. Ouch. Can you see anything of the elder brother in yourself? Those are two awkward questions. I don't want to end there because there is a third character. I can't end there with those two questions. The picture that ought to be left in the mind is the one that I hope is still on the screen, that of the father. Yes, the father had two sons. Yes, he lost both sons in different ways. But the great bit about this parable is that he never gave up on them. Just watch him now leaving the party and going outside to plead with his elder son. The neighbors are appalled. 
that he demeans himself by leaving the party and going to talk to that boy out there. Listen to him begging his son to come in and greet his brother. See him standing there taking the abuse, the wounds that come in the question, you never gave me anything so that I might have a party with my friends, did you? And that wounds him. But he answers so gently and so courteously. My son, everything I have is yours. And you are always at my side. This is the Father. This is our God. Go further back in the story and cast your mind back to the point where he sees the young son coming in the distance. All the days of his long absence, he has spent watching, longing to see the shape of his son against the, against the skyline in the horizon. And he suddenly catches a glimpse of his silhouette in the far distance. And he runs towards him. People who own land, people who are pillars of their society, don't run. His legs have never seen the sun. But they do now. He girds up his loins and goes for it. It's a fantastic picture. And when they meet, the son prepares this speech and gives it to it. Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired. He doesn't get that far. The father basically says in the nicest possible way, shut up. And envelops him, flings himself at him and holds him tight, not letting go and feeling the ribs because there's no flesh on him. Hasn't had a decent meal for ages. And knowing everything and accepting everything and obliterating everything in one great bear hug. It's a lovely picture. I said I wouldn't mention it, but no one catches it better than Rembrandt. Actually, because Rembrandt knew some of this story in himself. This, my son, was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. The father has no thought of higher servants. The father's thoughts are all of rings and shoes and robes and feasting and celebration. This is the father in the story, but this is our God. And that's where I want to end. Because these are the very thoughts of God when we come home to him, either from the far country or not being very good disciples, a bit elder brotherish. The thoughts of God when we come home are, this is my son who's come home. This is my daughter who's a long way off. I love a story that John Pritchard, many of you will remember John Pritchard, he was bishop, he was at Cranmer first and then he was uh, bishop of uh, Jarrow and then bishop of Oxford and all that, he's now retired. He tells a great story, he'd taken a service, a communion service in Canterbury Cathedral and afterwards a man came up to him at the end of the service who was clearly moved and said to him, I haven't been to a service for 30 years. And as John tells the story, John said to him, welcome home. The man said with tears in his eyes, that's exactly it.